Hello and welcome back to the sixth week of CAL Academy of International Law on International Environmental Law, everyone. I am Asla Korkmaz, your teaching assistant for the week once again. And today we have Professor Lawrence Boson de Chazuns uh, with us. Professor Boasson is a professor of international law at the University of Geneva School of Law and the director of the LLM International Dispute Settlement, as well as co director of the Geneva Center for International Dispute Settlement. She covers a plethora of fields such as international economic law, international dispute settlement, international environmental law, and the law of international organizations, and boundaries and law of the sea. Now I will pass it on to Dr. Oral for a few more words and then we will continue. Thank you, Asla, and greetings to all of you. Uh, welcome back um, to the fifth week and our fifth um, special guest lecture. Uh, and on behalf of Patricia and myself, we are absolutely thrilled to have our very dear colleague and friend, uh, Professor Laurence Boisson de Chazurin uh, today with us. Uh, also um, said plethora in describing the vast area of work. I know that um, Professor is very modest, but I think Patricia and I can agree that she is really one of the most accomplished uh, international lawyers. She does internet, she has appeared before the ICJ, arbitration, uh, WTO panels. So today she's talking about environmental law, which she really has a great deal of experience. We also know her from the Global Pact, but really an extremely accomplished um, international lawyer. So we couldn't be luckier and more happy to have you, dear Laurence, with us. So I will turn the floor over to you and we look forward to your lecture today. Thank you, Nilfer. It's really a, a pleasure to be welcomed in such a way by Patricia Galvao-Teles and, and, and uh, Nilufer uh, Oral because uh, they are very good friends and it's, uh, it's nice to be with them and to be able to exchange. I would also like to thank uh, Professor Lai for being with us this morning. We are co-teaching this module on environmental law, so it's a pleasure uh, to exchange ideas with her too. So today, and I'm going to ask Aditya, we, we are going to be speaking about the uh, where we are in terms of environmental law at the eve of the Stockholm uh, Plus 50 uh, conference. Uh, as you may know, uh, and I'll come back to the Stockholm conference, but next year on, on, in June 2022, will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of uh, the Stockholm conference. And I thought that uh, to understand what we've done, what we've achieved with uh, international environmental law, this would be a good moment to reflect and to look back at uh, what we've done. So um, when we speak about international uh, environmental law, in fact, we speak of a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, everything is relative and uh, you're all quite young, so uh, you're going to, the perspective might be different, but I think from a perspective of international law, we can still say that environmental law is a, a relatively recent phenomenon. There were in fact, everything for me started really at the end of the 60s, early 70s. In the 60s, uh, what we could see, we saw signs of awareness uh, with, for example, the publication of uh, the book of Rachel Carson's on Silent Spring, the use of pesticides in the United States, the fact that the birds were dying. So this alerted some people. We had maritime uh, disasters, things to think, uh, think about uh, the excellent Valdez accident and so on. And so people realized that um, they could, there, was, there were things that would be deter that would deteriorate the environment and the, that we would need to think about how to better protect the environment. And uh, we, what we've seen is that this science of awareness led the United Nations uh, in the early 70s to decide to convene an international conference. And that's the Stockholm Conference on Human Environment, which took place in Stockholm in June, 1972. 
And I think it's a very important time in the history of international environmental law, uh, both at the domestic level and at the international level. We discussed that with Professor Lai. It's, it's one, I think, of the features of environmental law is that they both developed at the same time, the domestic dimension and the international dimension. But so at what, what happened is that um, there was this decision to convene this conference. And, um, and in the wake of the convening of this conference and uh, thereafter, I think there people realized that we didn't have enough sufficient uh, uh, instruments. Uh, we, we didn't have uh, enough rules to deal with international environmental law. And that gave an impetus for developing further international environmental law. Now, just a few things about the Stockholm Conference on Human, Human Environment. Um, it's interesting because it's the first international conference, the first universal conference that was uh, dedicated to environment. If you look at the chart of the United Nations, you're not going to find the word environment because this was not a concern in the 40s. So I think it's really at that time that the United Nations decided that environmental protection should be one of the objective of the organization. The other feature I'd like to highlight when we speak about the Stockholm Conference is that it gathered all the actors that are key for promoting, protecting the environment. And if you look uh, carefully at those who were invited, the states, of course, international organizations, they came in, uh, in number, the scientific community, the NGOs, but also the private sector. The private sector was invited. And so what I want to stress, because I think it's important for us, is to realize that uh, right from the beginning for international environmental, it was considered that these four categories of actors were crucial for promoting and preserving the environment. So we had the uh, Stockholm Conference. I think it was a very successful conference in a way that uh, there was... Uh, an agreement that something should be done about the environment, a declaration was adopted, um, an, an action plan was adopted, and uh, there was the decision to put in place an institution dedicated to environmental law, and that's the UNEP, uh, UNEP the Uni United Nations Environmental uh, Program that was established in 1974. So just to give an overview of where what we've done in terms of UN conferences since uh, Stockholm, uh, then there was the big conference in Rio in 1992. And there, for me, and we can discuss that, but I really think that it's really at this moment that there is a universalization of uh, the preoccupation of international in environmental protection in the sense that it's really in the 90s that states from the east, from the west, from the south, from the north, all agree that something should be done with respect to the protection of the environment. There too in Rio, the four categories are invited. The private sector is even more vibrant. The, the NGOs, they are in numbers, international organizations, they've start, started working on environment and states. But, and that is maybe something we can also um, reflect upon. It's really also in the nineties that we realize that you can't speak about environmental law without speaking of other bodies of law. And it's at this moment that states, and it's because the, the southern states ask for it, say we need to integrate environment and development and we need to have them work together. And I'll come back to that because I think it's still a challenge. Then afterwards, we had, uh, we had another conference in uh, 2012 uh, in Rio once more. But there, and there, I think it's we've uh, we've uh, we don't have anything really in terms of normative development. Yeah, I forgot to say that for the Rio conference, very importantly, we have a declaration of principles which is adopted. The Rio Prince, the Rio Declaration, is a key, a crucial instrument. It's our charter with respect to uh, the principles that for identifying the principles uh, for protecting the environment. We have a, a gigantic action plan, which is adopted agenda, agenda 21, which still is of great relevance. Uh, on the institutional level, not much, and that is maybe also a, a, a topic of discussion. 
And one thing I think which is crucial in the 90s that I would like to stress is that the finance, finance is going to become a key factor for, for protecting the environment. So I went back to the 90s, to the Rio conference, and now I'm going back to 2012, uh, the other conference in uh, Rio. And what I want to say is that there, it's, we're no more in the same uh, frame of mind. We're no more in this idea that we should develop further the principles of actions. It's more, we are no, the, I think we are switching and there is what I call a paradigm shift. We are shifting towards operationalization of uh, environmental protection. And at that time in Rio in 2012, uh, people speak about green economy. And we start to speak about uh, the, uh, the, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So goals to achieve. And I think this is um, something which is important is that um, most of the body of law that was developed that we still need today was developed in the early uh, 90s. I want, I want, with that, I mean the architecture, the framing of the principles of action. So there we are, and 2022, uh, the General Assembly has decided to celebrate the 50th anniversary of uh, the uh, Stockholm Conference. And I thought that, uh, so what are we going to celebrate? I think that's important. Uh, it's not an existential question, but I think it makes us think about what we've done and what needs to be done. So a few points. As I've said, I think it's uh, still, we can still consider that it's a re relatively young body of law when we speak of environmental law, but it's already quite mature. It's quite mature. Um, it has developed, the way I see it is that uh, after in the wake of the Stockholm conference, uh, we had a great number of conventions uh, that were adopted to think of the Ramsar convention, things, think of CITES, think of the Bone convention and others. But they were, they were sort of favoring, and we were learning at that time, they were favoring a sectoral approach. So you regulate a technique for protecting species, you regulate, you protect an area, regional seas program of UNEP, or you protect certain species. Let's think of migratory species with the Bone Convention. So this was an important approach, but very soon it it, we realized that it was not sufficient. And so in the 80s, the negotiators, we, because I think it's we, uh, we the people of the United Nations, we started to develop a new approach, which is a global approach. And uh, we were realizing that there were global problems and we needed to work all together. Uh, think of the ozone layer. So with the Vienna Convention, think of climate change, think of uh, biodiversity, and uh, think then of uh, the desertification convention. So a global approach, because we're all living, look at the preamble of the Rio uh, Declaration, it's quite inspiring because we're all living in this small planet and we need to, to protect the planet. So, but when we speak of a global approach, there we're moving towards a multi-sectoral approach, and it's much more complex. There is a lot of complexity at, at stake. Uh, we all need to work together, and we know that uh, we're part of the same planet, but we have different aspirations, different concerns. So we have to consile all these uh, concerns. And the additional element with respect to the global approach, I think, is that we were entering into territories where there were a lot of uncertainties. And that I think that's something that we should all remember, is that when we speak about environmental protection, we speak, we, we know a certain number of things, but there are a lot of things we don't know. And we should be very humble with respect to the knowledge that we have. And uncertainty and managing uncertainty is also accepting that there, there are certain things that we still don't know and that we, we should address these uncertainties and we should maybe prevent some damage for, damages from occurring. Now, so we have this first generation of conventions, we have the second generation of conventions and very often, and I would uh, love to hear you and to hear Nilufer and Patricia, but it seems to me that uh, in fact, what we need is a, is a more holistic approach because already we're seeing 
signs of fragmentation. We think signs of fragmentation because, uh, for example, the scientist tell, tells us that you know you you're concerned with climate change, but what you're doing in the context of the Montreal the pro, the, the Montreal Protocol is also of importance for climate change. And now, uh, all what we're doing, and you have the great expert, which is uh, Professor Oral, but with the high seas, fisheries and so on, it's so much linked to climate change and so on. And so it's not that I'm saying that we should have a new convention because that, I don't think that is going to be the answer. But I think we should learn how to look at all these pieces all together. And, um, and it seems to me that one thing that the Stockholm conference could do is just to remember us, everybody that we have these pieces and they have to work all together. And uh, so we can see that there are so, certain signs of interconnections, for example, the secretariats of conventions are working together uh, and so on, but is it sufficient? And that's the first question. Now, the other, uh, challenge for me is that uh, we have a great number of instruments, but every time we look at the effects on the ground, we're quite disappointed, okay? And, uh, and, and it is said by the scientists, by, the, by people de dealing with uh, nature conservation and so on. So there is a new approach that has been framed within the United Nations, which is uh, an approach based on goals, indicators, targets. It's the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I think they are, I more and more consider that the SDGs are very important and that we should look at them quite carefully, we lawyers. Now, having worked more carefully on one of them, the SDG 6 dealing with water, what you realize is that in fact, uh, the objective, the targets, the indicators have been framed, uh, taking into account the legal instruments that were developed, okay? The conventions, uh, uh, the case law of, uh, of, uh, of various courts and tribunals. So it's, there is, I think, legal legitimacy uh, for promoting uh, these uh, this sustainable development goals. What they're doing is that they're promoting the reaching of objectives by 2030. And uh, for us, we can, I think we should be watching that. Now, we lawyers, we see that in fact, there is a lot of attention put on effectiveness. Okay. But how do we measure effectiveness? How do we assess effectiveness, we lawyers? And I think it's important because effectiveness for the time being, we've been looking at the effectiveness of an instrument, but we've not really been looking at the effectiveness of the impacts of this instrument on the ground. And that may be a contribution that uh, we should think about. So I've been speaking about, uh, and it's always something which is interesting for me, I've been speaking a lot about uh, international environmental law, and it's as if we all would accept and agree on a definition of the environment. And it's what, what is always striking for me is that we never give any definition of the environment because we take it for granted that we know what is the environment. And um, for that, I looked at some of the instruments and uh, in fact, it's uh, in the conventions dealing with civil liability that you have sometimes definitions because they want to limit the, the compensation that is going to be paid if there is a damage to the environment. But otherwise, it's, it's difficult to find uh, definitions. And I thought that the definition that the tribunal gave in the Iron Wine Award of 2005 I didn't put the date, I'm sorry about this, but 2005, it was a in the context of a dispute between Belgium and the Netherlands. And um, I think the tri tribunal sort of wanted to have a modernized interpretation of a treaty of the 19th century and say that environment, the environment should find place. But it's not really the purpose of this lecture, but the what, why I'm referring to this award is because uh, I like the definition that is given in this um, in this uh, in this award of the environment, and uh, you see that, and I think that we've gone a long way because uh, now when we refer to the environment, we refer to the natural resources that we always refer to: water, land, flora, and fauna. 
But then we also refer to natural ecosystems. And that I think is the new key concept of international environmental law is to protect the environment through the protection of ecosystems. And uh, uh, the International Court of Justice has made a great contribution uh, in its 2018 decision with respect to the compensation of damage when it said uh, the prism for looking at compensation is the notion of ecosystem. But there too, an ecosystem we should be humbled because we know about some ecosystems, but we don't know about all the ecosystems. And, uh, and then when we speak about ecosystems, we speak of dynamics, we speak of interrelationship between the different components. It's difficult for us lawyers because we're rather static in our way of looking at things. Now, if you look at other components of this definition, human health is there. And in fact, after COVID-19, uh, not after, but during COVID, because we're still in this crisis, um, human health is intrinsically linked to the environment and it's part of the environment. Safety, climate, sites. I think that one thing which is missing is culture, because I think that the environment is, the culture is also very much related. Cultural religions are very much related to the environment and we should integrate them. But that is also food for thought for us. Is there a way, is this the right definition of the environment or if we, should we enlarge it a bit? That's a question. Then other questions um, in relation to um, how we've sort of fabricated, we have fabricated international environmental, which are the instruments uh, that we have used um, and, uh, and I'd like to give some reflections of where we are and uh, maybe what could be done. When we look at the, we think at the sources of international environmental law, they are not very different from sources of international in other areas of international law. But there are certain features that I'd like to highlight. So we have relied on a great number of treaties. Uh, treaties have been key instruments for developing international environmental law. Um, they, are, they exist in great number, okay? There is a very large number of instruments, treaties of bilateral, regional, universal, dealing with international environmental law. My concern, but it's not just my concern, it's a concern of uh, uh, we lawyers is that um, this uh, led, leads us to fragmentation once more, okay? Because uh, we are isolating one problem vis-a-vis uh, -vis other problems. And I'll come back to that later on, but still treaties are good, but treaties don't help us to look in a holistic perspective. Now, when we discuss about uh, treaties in the field of international environmental law, I think that uh, there is a category of treaties that we should mention, the framework conventions, be they named framework or not. A lot of the environmental agreements that we have have a framework nature. And what do, do I mean by that? I mean that you, the states adopt a, a convention, which is... Uh, the basis the, which established the foundations of a regime then which is complemented by uh, protocols, other types of agreements, uh, modified by amendments, adjustments, and so on. And I, uh, gave, I gave you the example of uh, the um, climate change regime, which I think is a good illustration of it, but we could also look at biodiversity. Now, in the context of this regime, what I think the sign of this regime is that they're going to evolve. It's not the instrument that you've adopted. For example, the Paris Agreement, you've ad we have adopted it in 2015, but surely it's going to be complemented and a big change and be changed in, uh, in Glasgow in, in November. So what I want to sort of stress is that there is mobility in these regimes and we should really, we should take into account this issue because we should always go ahead with the, the development of the scientific knowledge. And in light of the scientific knowledge, we should uh, maybe modify our attitude or we should complement uh, uh, certain provisions which are insufficient. And how do we do this? Mostly we're going to do this through secondary law. 
What I mean by secondary laws, I refer to the decisions of the, conference of the conferences of the parties, but also of other uh, organs of these uh, conventions. And uh, those uh, bodies are going to adopt uh, decisions, recommendations, and so on, put in place mechanisms, uh, think of non-compliance, think of finance mechanism, and so on. And so they're, they're developing these regimes. And uh, for us lawyers, I think we've, we've, we've accepted that the secondary legislation will should play a key role. It plays a key role in the CITES regime, in other regimes. But we still have some uncertainties as to the legal uh, status of these decisions. And when we have a state which wants, uh, wants to oppose to something, the easy way is to say, but what is this law and what is the status of this instrument? And uh, I think we should sort of strengthen this. So that's the first element that I want to say. The other element I'd like to stress with this is that um, we should get rid of this distinction between binding and non-binding because uh, these decisions of the conference of the parties, some can be binding, but not all of them are binding. And it doesn't mean that they don't produce legal effects. And so that's, a thing, I think, maybe a field of exploration is to think further about how to sort of take into account these developments and locate them uh, in uh, the field of international law and accept that we have regimes and not just one primary instruments and that the secondary legislation is complementing the primary legislation. Then in terms of sources, we have customary international law. Um, I think customary international law play, plays a role mostly through uh, the framing of principles, uh, and we have a great number of principles that have been framed. I think that uh, we owe a lot to the negotiators of the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development because it's still the key uh, document for identifying which are the principles that we should sort of take into account. I don't want that there is. I don't want to say that there is a limitative list, but at least. It's, an, it's a document, a written document, which gives us uh, an indication of, of the important principles. It seems to me that um, the status of customer international law has been gained by a lot of these principles and uh, courts and tribunals have helped us to assert this uh, lex lata nature of these principles. But there are certain principles that are still in quest of uh, legal maturity and there are certain principles where I think we should towards which we should uh, I think uh, uh, focus a bit a bit more um, for example I've put it but the environment impact assessment I don't think that at the universal level we yet have an understanding of this principle uh, the court made some the international court of justice made some efforts in 2010 in the pulp mills case but it's largely it's it's it said that it's a principle of general international law, but it didn't give any guidance as, as to the content of this principle. And there, I think that we lawyers have to think a bit further how to sort of frame the content of this principle. It seems to me too that uh, we need to think a bit more about the protection of the global commons from a legal perspective. Um, does the principle two of the Rio uh, Declaration uh, make a good job with respect to good uh, to uh, uh, global comments, I'm not sure that it's sufficient. So there too, I think there is a, a need for further reflection. Now, beside this, uh, this sort of classical sources, I think soft law plays a very important role. And in this context, uh, I'd already have said so, but the Rio Declaration was really a step forward, which was uh, very important. And um, I was preparing this lecture, I was reflecting, should we attempt to uh, have another of this type of instrument? So you, there is the Global Pact for the Environment, which uh, it's an initiative which has been launched by a uh, number of, uh, of international lawyers and domestic lawyers. Um, the, should it play the same function that the Rio Declaration? For me, we still have open question. I think there is room for something, I don't know if the Global Pact is the sort of the follower of the Rio Declaration. What, what I want 
what I'm very concerned with uh, as an international lawyer is that we should protect as much as possible the acquis of the Rio Declaration on Environment and, Devel and, Environment and Development. And we should really preserve uh, all the developments which have been achieved through this uh, declaration. And then comes, aside from, you know, sort of this interstate um, sources of international law, uh, standards, technical regulations, and codes of conduct, and so on. And um, so there we see that in the field of environment, as in the field of health, there is a need for technical standards. There is a need for scientific standards, to, and so on. And, uh, and what we see that in practice, in fact, it has been admitted. And so we have certain institutions which are devoted to the production of these standards and technical regulations, which are going to feed, in fact, uh, the interpretation and application of uh, the uh, treaties. But for us, is the question, I think, is um, what is their status and how could to capture them so that uh, those who are making the commitments to abide to them are held accountable. And uh, there is still some uncertainty about that. There is also the legitimacy uh, challenge because uh, when you have the standards and technical regulations which are elaborated, I think they should associate all the concerned actors. And uh, uh, it's not just the producers, for example, but it's also the consumers. It's not uh, just uh, the, um, the pharmaceutical uh, industry that should be involved. It's also the ones, uh, the patients and so on. So we need also to build this, uh, uh, this reflection about what is the, what should be the legal and legitimacy grounds of uh, in the elaboration of standards and technical regulations. So uh, a few features which um, raise questions. Uh, um, in addition to all what I've said, and it's also going back to, to what I've said, um, time. Time is crucial and we know that. And uh, what, for the time being, how we've looked at time, we've looked at it from, uh, we've reacted to events. And I think that we've done rather well because uh, each time we've adopted new instruments and so on. But at the same time, you know that one of the specific features of international environmental law is to anticipate, to uh, think about the future. And it's also, as uh, the Brundtland report said, is that you have to integrate uh, the fact that the future generation should have an environment which is as good as your uh, the environment that we know and um, it seems to me that uh, one of the challenges for us is the anticipation i don't think that we've still framed this approach that uh, we can think of the future and we can integrate the future generations in this context i must say that i'm a great admirer of, and I will say so at the end, but of the, uh, of the Constitutional Court of Germany when it, uh, in its latest decision, when it said to Germany, what you're doing is, is at the detriment of the future generations because you're asking the generations in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s to pay the price of your inaction of today. And I think that's the type of language that we should be developing. Important of processes, we know that, I've told you about the regimes, it's accretion. It's always in evolution and how to capture that. Intra and inter, 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 intergenerational equity, this goes with anticipation. It's true that we need to think about the present generations and I'm very, I agree entirely with that. But we also need to link this, the present generations to the future generations. And uh, it seems to me that there too, there is a need to reflect a bit more on how to do it. Now, sovereignty, and I put it because sovereignty is coming back at the forefront everywhere in the le political language and even legal language and so on. We know that sovereignty is a key concept, that it's a structural concept for understanding the international legal order. But we have done, we have overcome this uh, uh, the bar, the sovereignty barrier in a way that uh, we know that we need to cooperate. And a lot has been done in the field of cooperation because uh, a single state can't face most of the environmental uh, challenges. So the, the, the states need to work together. 
what I think we've not yet really um, done and we still need to work on that is how to reconcile sovereignty over natural resources, the protection of the environment and sustainable development. Okay, And that I think that we have sort of identified pathways, sustainable development, because we think we should integrate them. But when you look at uh, the way sustainable development has been interpreted, it's a, it's a balance of interest, but you don't you wonder who is doing this balance of interest and who should be doing this balance of interest and where to put the cursor and in this balance uh, of interest. And, uh, and mostly it's a casuistic approach. And uh, I don't think that we have yet uh, achieved this understanding of what is sustainable development. Another issue which also which I think is important to us when we speak about international environmental law, we should not just speak in normative terms, we should also speak in institutional terms. And there, what do I want to say? I want to say that um, institutions are crucial. And it's quite interesting that right from the beginning in Stockholm, when they convened all the actors, international organizations were convened, okay? And um, and what was the outcome of the Stockholm conference? It was the decision to establish an international institution, which is UNEP. So that's something which is interesting. Now, in the subsequent meetings, there's been some disappointment, disappointment about the uh, institutional outputs, if I could call them like this because states have been more and more reluctant to sort of have strong institutions dealing with the environment. I'm not sure that we need a single institution. I think that the environment is transversal, but we need a, a voice for the environment and a, a strong voice for the environment, a voice which can penetrate all the institutional fora and speak about the environment. I don't think it's only states which should, um, which should be part of these institutions. Um, NGOs and other actors have a role to play. And then in this context, I think that we have some sort of interesting uh, experiments with the public-private partnerships. But there with the public-private partnerships, I think the issue of accountability is not yet resolved because we don't know really what is their legal status in international law. We need these institutions for um, compliance and compliance meaning, you know, thinking about is this the right instrument or should we modify this instrument, but also compliance in a way, does this state, does, does this state do what it should be doing and so on. And there, I think big steps have been achieved, really. Non-compliance procedures are quite interesting yeah, and, uh, and there, there are quite several of them, but um, is it enough to reach the effectiveness? That's uh, the question. I think they've been able to engage a dialogue. They've been able to engage the states to make them accountable about what they're doing. But I'm not so sure that uh, we've reached this point where through compliance and dispute settlement, we can say this was not what you were supposed to do or you should have done because really this is not going to achieve much in terms of environmental protection. And the, among the institutions, I think the, um, the courts and tribunals play an increasing important role. Uh, they play an increasing important role because um, there is, and we can speak about it with uh, Nilufer and Patricia, but uh, because they are both members of the uh, International Law Commission. But it seems to me that uh, there are areas of law where there is no willingness to go further in terms of negotiations and so on. So the courts and tribunals are, I think, clarifying, clarifying a lot, you know, what is at stake. Yeah? what uh, and indicating the road to pursue through the uh, uh, through the identification of principles and so on so and I, I mentioned for example the international the decision of the international court of justice uh, in relation to compensation i think that the court said environmental damage environmental damages to the environment okay not economic damages to the people uh, should be compensated this is a big step because now we need to think about how we should do this compensation. Um, now, from a domestic perspective, I think the domestic courts have been extraordinary 
extraordinary. There are a lot now of articles about uh, what they've done in the field of climate change, uh, articles on also of what they've done in the field of biodiversity. We should, uh, we should empower them more. We should give them all the means that they need really to, because for me, when I read the decisions of domestic courts, I find them much more creative that, than international courts and tribunals. And uh, this is maybe a question, why are they more creative and why are they more temerary and, uh, and willing to, to speak about uh, how to uh, better protect the environment? So some words of uh, conclusion. As you've seen, heard what I've said is that um, I think that uh, there is um, a growing understanding among states and other components of the international society of the importance of international environmental law. Um, I don't have any doubt about this. I think that environment, which was rather marginal in the 70s, is becoming a crucial uh, issue in today's world. Um, my, my, my concern is, as you've, you've understood, is that how to put all the pieces of the pieces of the pulse together so that we give a, a holistic and coherent vision of what is environmental law. It seems to me that uh, environmental law has been able also to penetrate other fields of, uh, of uh, regulation. Um, uh, we can speak of the law of the sea, we can speak of human rights. Uh, you've heard that uh, the Human Rights Council uh, the, last week has adopted a resolution proclaiming the right to a, a clean environment. And so I think more and more humanitarian law, more and more they are reflecting about, you know, uh, the impacts on the environment. So there are convergences. Should we strengthen them? This is a question. It seems to me that uh, the United Nations was, uh, uh, they were right to put uh, the emphasis on effectiveness. It has to be reinforced effectiveness because otherwise, and we, there will be this, uh, also this meeting of the COP on, on biodiversity. If we don't strengthen the effectiveness, uh, uh, our words are going to remain words. And I think this is something that we have to care from a legal perspective. But as I've said, I'm not so sure that we lawyers have a language for testing and speaking about effectiveness. So the end is, um, We've done quite a lot, but is it sufficient or too little? And what should be the next step? So that's a question mark, and I would be very happy to speak to you about all these issues. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, this was really a fantastic lecture in a short period of time. You really squeezed in 50 years of incredible development in international environmental law, starting from Stockholm even the 60s actually, and bringing us up to now and posing some very critical questions. Um, and I think that I hope we have a really good discussion, particularly on the, the role of law, effectiveness. Um, you also raise issues. I mean, it's interesting to look at the 1972 Stockholm Declaration and the context it was in but you highlighted the changes that took back in 1992 and the universalization, meaning that you really had the global participation and how did that impact the continuation? So I think you've given us so many, um, uh, uh, what you call nuggets of questions and thoughts. And instead of my talking, I'm hoping that we'll have some questions and have a great discussion um, well, we have, yes, amazing. Thank you so very much, Professor Chazorn. Uh, so we have a very positive feedback here. Um, but let's start maybe um, with the, the last question you posed. How do we, and as, as in it, from the legal perspective, um, promote, and I think it's so important, this idea of really effectiveness, as you have said, I mean, the number of instruments in, in, in environmental law, international environmental law is, is astounding, really. Um, and yet, can we say we've actually achieved results? Yes, maybe no. Um, I think the global pact you mentioned was one attempt or hope to, to bring together this 
under one umbrella, uh, the notion of legal principles um, in order to, to perhaps consolidate and bring about effectiveness. You mentioned compliance. You've also talked about uh, international courts and domestic courts. And it is true, the domestic courts are having tremendous impact, particularly we see with climate change. So how do we move this important issue you raised forward from the, uh, uh, from the legal perspective, and we can say domestic or international law? So that would be my question. And, and if you like, we can open it up to discussion from Patricia and uh, Professor Lai as well. I'm not going to give an answer to all these questions because I raised these issues. For me, I think that, you know, when I look and that, and maybe I'd like to have your reactions and Patricia's reaction and, and Professor Lai's reaction, but for me, international, in international law, we have a language which is rather rudimentary, which is, it's always something that has fascinated me that, uh, you know, for example, soft law, we put everything in soft law because it's a box, okay? Uh, hard law, we don't really know what it means except that it produces a, a binding effect. Effectiveness, we lawyers are a bit unsure about how to deal with effectiveness. And we, uh, in fact, I was looking at other areas of international law and they are not, there's not much uh, written about this expect, ex except from um, what we call the experimentation theory, that you conduct products on the, on the, at the local stage and you test what can be get useful and produce uh, impacts, and then you bring it at uh, the upper level. So maybe that's an approach which can be, could be interesting. Well, if I could just add in, I know that I, and the role, and I think it's interesting, the role of um, courts, um, and, and moving forward. And we do see that at uh, the international level, there seems to be more of an appetite. And I know you were, of course, counsel in the international whaling case um, and others as well. There does seem to be more of an appetite for getting into uh, environmental issues and, and the compensation is one good example in the pulp mills case. Um, so for example, there is, a, a how should we be bringing states look to bringing more of these cases um, or civil society even trying to promote that at the international level? Or do you really think that it really is at the domestic level that the attention should be? For me, I think it's cases before the court, the International Court of Justice are important, but uh, it depends so much of uh, the political Seeing it depends so much of the jurisdictional issues that can be met and so on. So, because bringing a case before the International Court of Justice is a very important political decision for a state. So, um, it's, uh, you know, the environment is not yet a priority for, for that. And uh, so the whaling case, uh, it's an, it's an interesting case because it was about the convention. It's not strictly speaking an environmental case as sure. such, okay? Sure. But I think that what the court showed is that, and for us in environmental lawyers, it's important, is that Australia brought a case against Japan and because they were both parties to the 1946 convention, okay, on the protection of the whales. And Australia said, I'm a, as a party, I want, to, I want to challenge what Japan is doing with respect to the catching of the whales and so on. And that I think is very important because there was nothing to do with the EZ of Australia, the territorial sea of Australia and so on. So it was, it, everything was taking place in the high seas, okay? And, um, and there the court accepted that a party to a convention can bring another state party to a convention and challenge its behavior or her behavior as uh, with, with respect to the protection of a natural resource or to protection of the environment. I think this is important because it should, uh, and we have that now in the field of human rights with Gambia and Myanmar and so on. So why not thinking a bit further about this? But as I've said, I think it's a, it's a, it's a political decision which is important, but there yeah. are other fora where maybe we could discuss these issues. I think the law of the sea tribunal is also an important institution. And we don't think enough about the uh, ITLOS and ITLOS has given rendered decisions, which are very important for, for the strengthening of uh, uh, international environmental law. But really today, for me, the courts which have 
which should play a very important role, they already play an important role, uh, are domestic courts. If I may say something, yes. Um, I, I think you made some very good points, uh, which I agree with. And, and one of the issues you also mentioned is that we need to bring in culture. And um, now that you mentioned the whaling case, I remember I was um, in Thailand for one of the COP meetings on CITES. And I was surprised to see a group of young Japanese um, um, demonstrating uh, against whaling. So I know that Japan is always, you know, emphasizing its right to whale, right? So I went up and I spoke to these young people and I said, you know, your country, you know, keeps arguing for the right to continue whaling. And why are you protesting against it? And they said, you know, we completely disagree with our country. Our country says they have that we Japanese have a customary, uh, have a custom of um, hunting whales. And they said, it's not true. We did not hunt whales. You know, there was only a very small proportion of the fisher folk. And they, they, they claim that um, whaling was encouraged after the war because the people were starving. And the Americans uh, encouraged Japan to hunt. So they said, you know, what constitutes a custom? How long must it be in practice? before it is a custom. And they say, we completely disagree that our country has a custom of hunting whales. <laughs> so I thought that's very interesting. Yeah. Now, and it also brings us also to you know, the, the local tribunals. Um, I was just going to say, in, in, I'm, more, uh, I, I'm actually more a, a local, not national laws, is, you know, not, I'm not an international lawyer, but I think there's a need for capacity building. And um, what we find is that judges, not many judges know environmental law. So uh, I think Asian Development Bank, UNEP and all that, they are trying hard, you know, in terms of uh, building capacity and the IUCN uh, Academy has been involved in training programs. So I think it's important. And also the setting up of specialized courts um, focusing on the environment where the, the judges are specially trained and they even better, they may have a background in the science relating to the environment. Yeah. I agree you. with, yeah, I agree with, I always remember, but you know, this is personal, but um, reading about all this documentation about the whaling, uh, whaling, I think it was, people were saying it's a generational issue in Japan. Okay. That's true. And the too. generation below 45, it's no more really a cultural issue for them. As you rightly say, it, I don't know, it should be tested with people yeah. living in, in Japan. <laughs> sure. But uh, it's, um, the, the question with the, with where, the ways was very interesting because it was uh, conserving for the future. Okay. And, and, but, but Japan was also saying, I do experiments, I do research, scientific research for the future too. And you have to, it's always this thing. And that, that's what I like with the environment is also this balance of interest that you have to establish because research is also important because as I've said, we don't know everything and we need to know more about the environment. Thank you. I see we have a question from one of our participants um, from Tanuki. Tanuki Natasha Gunesinghe from Sri Lanka. Um, and Professor, thank you very much for your lecture. The question is, if there is a case of a severe case of deforestation in a country, can the polluter pays principle be extended to apply to the perpetrators of deforestation? Bit of an unusual ex extension would like your opinion on this. So I think you mean to uh, private actors, I gather is the question. It's, uh, it's a difficult question and you're going to be able to help me to answer this. Um, <laughs> it's uh, because there are different levels. First of all, um, deforestation of this type, I think would be illegal. So it's an issue of uh, the legal system of a country and uh, how you can you can pursue someone before courts. Um, I, I didn't mention something which I think is very going to be important for us. This the 
so the, the strengthening of the strengthening of the notion of ecocide, okay, uh, from a criminal perspective is that, and you see that in more and more countries, um, they are turning towards criminal law for uh, punishing the people who are uh, uh, damaging the environment. So that could be another road. Um, the polluter pays principle, yes, it, sh it should find application, but it's not really, I don't think it finds application in a, in a system where you need to sanction. And it's, it's, it's also uh, uh, the functioning of, of the legal system, which is at stake now. From an interstate perspective, it, I was just thinking it could be interesting because uh, if we could consider that this country is letting this deforestation going on, which is a, which ha and it has an impact on other countries, uh, couldn't we say that there is an issue of global commons which is at stake? And uh, and remember that we had these discussions about Brazil. Okay, uh, can Brazil let all this deforestation go on? There too, I, I think that we need further research on these issues. I'm not so sure that we have one single answer about this. Yeah, it's interesting. In fact, I know in the commission, and maybe Patricia will pipe in as well, we've had some discussions about principles, general principles of uh, international law, and of course, um, where environmental principles may fit into this. But some in some of our d debates, you know, the status of, for example, the polluter pays principle, you know, does it have status customary international law? Um, so that's another issue, how that would fit in. But again, I welcome questions from, um, let's see if we have other questions here. Um, let's see. Well, we have a comment um, that uh, from Shayla Kong Mukwili from Cameroon who says, very true, particularly in Africa and Cameroon, where I come from, there is a gap in knowledge as environmental law in general and marine environmental law are concerned. Um, so I would think that where the effectiveness of the rule of law in this domain can be well appreciated. So thank you for that comment. Oops, um, all right. Patricia, did you have uh, something you might want to share as well while participants may think of further questions? Sure. Now, I want to also, you know, join uh, Nilfer in, in uh, uh, thanking uh, Laurence for this uh, excellent um, lecture and this uh, really tour d'horizon through the development of uh, international environmental law and, and the challenges now at this very important moment. And one thing I think it's, um, you know, it's frustrating for us as international lawyers, but I think also as citizens and human beings, and I'm sure that, you know, our participants feel the same, um, that we have, you know, such a unique opportunity now, um, again, with important milestones, um, you know, the 50 years of the Stockholm Declaration, the 30 years of the, of the um, Rio Declaration. And, and uh, you know, in the past, these moments have been used to, um, you know, go a step further and strengthen um, the architecture, even if it was through soft law, uh, political declarations. Um, and so in a, in, in a way for me, it's, um, it's a bit frustrating that we have such a unique moment and there are signs and, and I, I fully agree. And I think the remarks that you made um, regarding the, the need for an holistic approach, uh, the need also from the institutional point of view uh, maybe not so much of a new institution, but at least a, um, a common voice for the environment. I think that was what you had, um, used as an expression. And um, this would be moments for me for the reinforcement um, of, uh, of, um, of both the legal architecture and with the holistic approach and the global pact would be an example, but also for an institutional uh, strengthening in, in terms of uh, I think the mainstreaming has been done, but maybe we need a stronger, um, a stronger voice. Maybe not a new institution, but of course, at the same time, we we realize that this is such a difficult time now politically um, for for taking new steps. So I I'm um, a bit discouraged by um, you know the balance that you make where we are and what we could do and what we need to do and that we're not doing. <laughs> I think that's the that's the problem and the political leadership is lacking certainly is, is lacking in that respect. But at the same time, then we have 
you know, signs of encouragement, um, like the creation of the, um, uh, the well, there's a new uh, special rapporteur for human rights and climate change that was also created last Friday by the Human Rights Council, together with, you know, the recognition by the Human Rights Council, and then let's see what's going to happen with the GA, uh, the recognition of a right to a healthy environment, which was one of the principles in the in, in the global pact also, um, and, and also the encouraging developments at the ICJ level, but also at the domestic courts level. And I think, the, I mean, the domestic courts are an important tool also in the system of international law in general. So I, I share, I think, this mixed balance, uh, but I think we should really be uh, trying to <laughs> see uh, with, uh, you know, um, and, and, and that's why, and I speak about this because it was also the part that I lectured to the participants about international lawmaking. I mean, how international lawmaking um, is much more, uh, complex um, than, than at the national level, but at the, at the same time where you have really to take this dynamic, comprehensive approach and, 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 and see how the law develops even through um, the COPs and, and through soft law and all of that. So this is a bit, I think we are in a, um, in, in a, in a mixed situation where we see some, some signs of, um, of hope, but then at the same time, some frustration that we're not able uh, to really do this, um, um, using the you know the, the historical moment where we are, where I would expect that uh, you know the Stockholm plus fifty uh, celebration would be an occasion uh, to have you know a strong commitment and and even some some new developments you know to, towards the you know better for uh, for the future. So this was just you know a general general comment, but I think your um, your lecture was fascinating in, in you know showing us all these intricacies of uh, of international environmental law, where we are and where we should go, <laughs> and that we're not going exactly in that direction. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, we have one more question. I am Leslie Tindarsan, and I always found that uh, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh is uh, still this developed country and trying to develop. Uh, uh, it's uh, now developing country uh, as uh, in this context, in this name. Uh, there is a much more problem uh, about investment related issues and environment pollution. Uh, always uh, as a policy maker, <coughs> sorry, as a policy maker, I always have found uh, that uh, there is uh, not so balanced environment uh, for investment related issues and uh, environment uh, protection. So, so uh, what should we need to focus uh, uh, on the time of policy implementation as like Bangladesh? Thank you very much. Yeah, unfortunately we had some background noise, but I hope you were under able to hear the answer. Um. She's in Bangladesh. There's investment um, yeah. coming in, but the question of balancing with environmental policy, and yeah. I think the question is how to do that. I mean, between investments and, yeah, and yeah, environment. Yeah. But she she is right to raise this issue because I didn't raise it, but it's transnational law is how to integrate environmental considerations in investment law, and I'm, there I think we need to, we need to pay attention to the integration. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I know you have another class yeah. <laughs> and uh, we would love to take more of your time, but I think we all want to applause uh, Professor Boisson de Chazurne for a fantastic lecture. And I wish we had more time to discuss the many questions you've raised. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you to you and Patricia for your invitation and uh, to all the participants. Thank you. Bye-bye.